and welcome. Uh, so I will tell you a bit about BioSilk. And this BioSilk is a new strategy that we have developed in order to be able to create um, a bioactive material. Um, so and as inspiration, we have used spiders. Um, spider silk is kind of nature's own high performance material. And it has not only inspired the scientists, but also movie creators, and that which has made silk very famous. Um, and the uniqueness of the spider silk is that it is both strong and elastic. And this is then combined in a very lightweight material. Typically, when you see a silk thread, you can barely see it. It's very thin, and still it is strong enough to capture even big insects in the fly. Um, some spiders can make seven different types of silk, depending on what they want to use it for. And the strongest one is the one that is called dragline silk. And that's the one, if a spider needs to flee, it uses this silk, the dragline silk. So probably all of you have seen sometime a spider kind of bungage outing out of nowhere, and then it uses this dragline silk. And all these types of silks are made of proteins. And it's a special type of proteins that is very long and repetitive, and they're called spidrins. Um, in the back of the spider, they have glands, which are like sacs, where they can store these proteins in a sol solution form. So then the spidrins are very concentrated, but still a liquid. And then when they're about to make the silk, this solution, which is called the dope, that is extruded through a duct, and during this extrusion, uh, the molecules, the protein molecules, are very cleverly rearranged so that they can pack closely together to get a lot of contacts between the molecules. And in that way, this solution has turned into a material instead of a liquid solution. Um, and some parts of these, these speedrun proteins then form crystals. And they are very stable, and that's make the material strong. And in between then, there are parts that are still like coils. So the material can be extended, stretched without breaking. And this is what gives the favorable properties to the silk, that it's both strong and elastic. <coughs> so although this silk is a very favorable material, the spiders are not that favorable to use as production hosts. It's not that easy to, to tell them what to do. Um, there are some labs that are using spiders as production hosts to get silk. And I also have some spiders in my office and I brought one with me here. Um, and I use them as more as reference material because um, they are not that easy to, to keep. Um, you have to, they are cannibals, they eat each other. So you ha can only have one in each box and also they they, you have to feed them with food that is still alive. And at least my spiders don't like fruit flies, so in order to get food for them, I, I need to go out and fetch living insects. And now when it gets colder, that's, yeah, you can imagine it's quite tedious. <laughs> uh, so we have instead chosen to um, use another strategy, recombinant DNA technology, and then instead let bacteria produce the speedruns for us. So we have taken the gene that encodes for this protein, the spidrin, and put that gene into something that is called an expression vector. And this expression vector is then transformed into a lab bacteria. And these bacteria are much easier to culture. They grow very well if you just feed them with sugar and water. And they expand, they, um, you get more and more of them, they grow very quickly. Um, and all each of these bacteria will then produce the speedrun for us. And these speedruns we can purify using conventional lab purification methods. And then we get a pure speedrun that we also can sterilize. So we can get the sterile protein solution. So um, we are the bacteria are not as good as the spiders. So we have used instead a bit simplified speedrun 
but it's still the part of the spidron that is needed in order to get this clever rearrangement of the molecules to lock themselves together into a strong silk material. Um, and this here you see a picture of, um, and I also have some samples here if you want to see later. Um, this is a picture of a bundle of many very thin silk threads that are then aligned together. And these are made then of the recombinant version of the spidrin. Um, so what should we do with this? When I tell people that I work with spider silk, I get a lot of suggestions of what to use it for. Uh, it's quite often high-flying ideas like you should use it for making bulletproof vests or seat belts for racing cars or uh, cable bridges or something like that. Um, I think that, I mean, the uniqueness of the silk is that it is uh, elastic. I don't want to use that for stopping bullets. I think it would stop the bullet after passing into my body. So that's not what I want to use it for. I also think it would be quite scary to walk on a bridge that is elastic. Um, so, uh, but there is one case where I think it's a really good idea to use a thin protein thread uh, which is both strong and elastic. So I will tell you about that option in, in the coming slides. As, as you heard in the previous talk, uh, our body consists of a lot of cells. And these cells need some kind of construction framework to order themselves to build up different tissues and organs instead of being just a pile of cells. Um, and this framework that the cells cling onto and build the tissue, that is made of very, very thin protein fibers. Um, in order to get the right cell type on the right places, it's also necessary that there are some bioactive proteins as like ladder steps on these protein threads. So that right cell uh, anchor to the right place. Um, and this is called tissue markers. Normally, it is the cells themselves that produces this framework that is instructive for them to make tissue. But if we are injured, uh, the cells need some temporary framework like this to start growing on in order to make the tissue. And I believe that this can be done by, using, by producing silk. Because there is one more um, advantage of having this silk proteins produced by a recombinant technology. Uh, because with this technique, it's possible to incorporate bioactive proteins like these tissue markers that can direct the right cell to the right place. This can quite simply be done at genetic level. You just fuse the gene that encodes the spider silk with the gene from the human body. And then these bacteria will instead produce uh, spidrins that are coupled to a tissue marker. And what is interesting with our type of spidrin is that it still has this propensity to form silk. Um, so it forms silk and this silk is very tightly decorated with these tissue markers. And since this process happens spontaneously under very mild conditions, um, these tissue markers are still bioactive. And it, it is it's even so that this can be done under totally physiological conditions. So you can actually, into the spidrin solution, add human cells, which then will be integrated into this protein fibrillar network. So it is thus possible to use the biosilk to integrate human cells in a framework of very thin protein fibers um, so that the cells can grow together very tightly together in three dimensions, which is quite like it is in real tissue. So in this micrograph here, you see that the cell nuclei are stained in blue and the cytoskeleton, uh, the inner part of the cells is stained in green. And the biosilk you can barely see because it's so thin. It's more or less just to glue the cells together in three dimensions, not more than that. Um, and here you see that the cells are oriented quite randomly. They are all over in all directions. And that's typically how it looks like in a lot of different tissue, like in the liver, in the skin and so. Um, 
and the inner part of those tissues, it's, it has this random orientation. But in some tissue, it's important that all cells work together in the same direction. For example, in a muscle, we want the cells to work together and not randomly. And then we can instead, instead allow this biosilk to form these type of fiber bundles that I showed before. So if we then integrate the cells while doing these fiber bundles, in between all these very thin silk fibers, there are cells and they are all aligned in the same direction. Um, so this method to, to incorporate the cells into three dimension by using the biosilk, it's in the practical, practically it's extremely easy. You just add the cells to a, s a spidrin solution and let it form the silk. Um, in most type of tissues, it's not just one type of cell. It's a, there are several cells and they have to grow together and communicate with each other and form real tissue. Um, and this is also then very easily achieved using this biosilk. You just add several cell types into this spirulina solution before you let it form the, the silk. And what is interesting here is that these thin protein threads that are um, composed of this biosilk, they are flexible enough to allow these cells to expand and grow and rearrange in this um, structure to to connect with each other and make tissue-like morphologies. So on, th on the right side here, um, here you see an example where we have added a small fraction of endothelial cells that are stained here in red. Endothelial cells are those cells that makes blood vessels. And here you can see, I hope, uh, that this endothelial cells have aligned after each other to form like a microvessel. Uh, so somehow these cells know how to connect with each other and make a microvasculature within this tissue construct. And in also in the same way, it's possible to make um, neural networks in the biosilk. Um, and of course, presence of vessels and nerves is important for almost all types of tissue. As soon as you want to have something that is more than just a few cell layers, the cells also need at least a microvasculature to, to survive. So with this biosilk, we um, have the possibility to make larger things uh, with cells, um, like larger cell constructs. Here are two examples of, of tissue-like pieces that are in the centimeter scale. Um, one with random orientation and one with this aligned orientation of the cells. And in these zoomed in pictures, you see that the cells are green. Uh, and that's because we have stained them here with a color that colors all cells that are alive in green. And as you can see, then it's an almost complete viability within these, these tissue-like pieces, although they are quite big. So we hope that this is a method that can be used generally to, to create tissue. And we are working on, on this for different applications in our lab. And we also hope that other people that work with cell would like to try this and, and um, continue developing it for different applications. Um, our first goal is to be able to develop functional tissue as models. Uh, we think that this could be used to make test hubs of functional tissue that could be relevant for testing of, for example, new uh, drugs, to have evaluate how the drugs uh, functions in a relevant tissue piece instead of in animals. Uh, and then later we hope that it could also be used clinically to replace damaged part in our body. Um, for example, if, if you have a broken tendon or um, if you have to fill up after a tumor restriction, or if if you want to heal some wound defect that are, is too big to heal by itself. Um, uh, but uh, that comes a little bit later. This is in the beginning of development of the method. Um, and we hope that we get help from also other labs to continue this development. Um, we have um, made some uh, 
tissue pieces ourselves at the lab. For example, we are working with developing skin pieces. Um, here is an example where we have then made a base of a fiber mesh with fiber blasts in. And this is to build up the dermis, which is the innermost part of the skin. Uh, and here the, the fiber blasts are staining red. On top of that, we have cultured keratinocytes, which is are the ones that, that should give the outermost part of the skin, the epidermal layer. Uh, so this we are working more on and we are also incorporating these blood vessels, the micro blood vessels into these to make a skin model uh, which is also vascularized. We are also working on creating more complicated tissue, like here um, is the aim for creating parts of pancreas. In this type of tissue it's very important that the cells communicate with each other in three dimensions and the right cell types gather together um, for it to be functional. For example, the beta cells, they need to cluster together into islet-like structures, because then the beta cells can respond to when we eat sugar, they should respond by production of insulin. And as you can see here, there are some really yellow areas. And that's where beta cells have ga gathered and produced insulin. The insulin is stained here in yellow. And here again, it's very important that this is vascularized so that it reaches out to the body. It, to be able to sense if we eat sugar, th it needs to be connected to the blood vessels. So this um, work that we are doing on BioSilk, uh, this is the current group, the Silk team, a, a bunch of very amazing people that are doing this uh, work. And um, I want to thank all of them, of course, and also thank the foundations that uh, are nice to support us with this and including then also KTH uh, and thanks for listening <laughs>